Mock exam, year nine, uh, selective breeding, uh, a little bit of extraction of metals, and um, inheritance, DNA, all that good stuff. Okay, so here we go. So we've got uh, the limbs of some animals, a man, a cow, a horse, a whale, a bird. Notice in each case, it goes one, then two, then many, five, five, five. Then one, then two, then many, five, five, five. One, then two, then many, then one. Yes, horses walk just on one finger. And whales go one, then two, then many, then, then okay, so it's, it's like one of the, the fingers has kind of evolved away. And one, then two, then many, then five. Cool. And the question says, describe how, how these limbs provide evidence for evolution. Well, they all evolved from the same creature. The same creature that had the bone structure. One, then two, then many, then five, five, five. And the uh, looking at bones, looking at pictures, or actually the bones themselves, we've got the evidence right there that they evolved from a common ancestor. Uh, they have all adapted for different functions. Uh, you can see how the bird is much better adapted for catching loads of air. And the whale is big for catching loads of water. And the horse for running faster. Yes, horses used to have the whole one, then two, then many, then five, five, five. And they evolved it away. It went from uh, five digits, five digits, down to four, three, two, and that one. Uh, and very interested to see, because I thought, and I'd said to year nines, that cows also walk on one digit. And I was wrong, they don't, it's horses. Yes, I thought it was all those grassy eaters. Um, cool, they've got a common ancestor, and the digits have evolved by natural selection. The birds that had smaller bones here couldn't fly as good and couldn't escape. And they got eaten. And similarly with the horses, the ones with one digit or less and less digits, they were the faster ones. They got away from the predators. They didn't get eaten and so therefore they had babies. Uh, they've got similar arrangements of bones. Okay, next one, next one, next one. Potatoes. This shows two varieties of potato plant. Okay, uh, A and B. Variety A. Large potatoes, few potatoes, slow-growing potatoes. Good. Not so good. Not so good. Variety B. Small potatoes, many potatoes, fast-growing plant. Not good. Yes, yes. So what we do is we are going to breed these together. And we're going to do it successfully many, many times. Breed the pollen from one of the plants with the ovules of another plant using a paintbrush. So just like a bee will go into the flowers and take the pollen from one plant to another, we can do the same job using a paintbrush. Getting the male gametes from variety A and mixing them with the female of variety B and making a hybrid seed that hopefully has all of these good um, traits. It will inherit the good ones. We hope. What you'll, you'll have to do this about a thousand times before you get one that has got all the ones you want. Uh, this one, this one, and this one. And the other 999, not so useful. But you just find you do it again and again and again until you get a seed that will give you large potatoes. Many potatoes growing fast plant. 
Uh, it says, new varieties of plum, potato plant can be produced by selective breeding. Yes, 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 yes. The scientist with the paintbrush, he selects, I'm going to breed variety A with variety B. It's not natural selection, it's not some bee or uh, any other kind of natural pollinator. Uh, hummingbirds do it as well. And some insects. Uh, explain how selective breeding of the two varieties of potato plants can produce new potato plants that are all faster growing and produce many large potatoes. Yes, this has been done. It was first of all done by the people in um, South America. And that's why they've got such a variety of potatoes, whereas we've only got five or six different varieties. Um, yeah, so, like I said, you grow them, you crossbreed them um, to grow new plants. You take the pollen from flower A to the flower from variety B. You make new plants. And you do this many times over many generations to get them better and better, larger and larger, faster and faster growing, until you get super potato plants, which we have nowadays after thousands of years of selective breeding by farmers. Uh, cool. Next question. Oh, chickens. It says, farmers selectively breed chicks, chickens to provide larger chickens. Figure 9 shows how the size of chickens has changed over time. Yes, chickens used to be a jungle bird. Uh, they don't fly so well because, well, in the jungle, if you're on the ground, suddenly flapping off into the distance, not very useful. You crash into bits of tree. So mostly they lived on the ground. They only flew when they were in danger and, and not very far, usually up to the little branches which is what they do today. Chickens can look after themselves when they're not in a chicken hutch. They can go onto the trees to keep themselves away from foxes. Chickens aren't stupid. Explain how farmers have used selective breeding to produce larger chickens. Oh, okay. Well, you get your chicken from 2000 years ago and you get the largest one and you breed the largest one you've got, male, with the largest one you've got, female. And then you collect all those chicks and you do this again and again and again over thousands of years and eventually you get the big large chickens we have today. You breed them together many generations, long period of time. Always selecting the largest ones. Here we go. Okay, that's got that. Describe one benefit and one risk. Okay, well the benefit is you get more food from each chicken. Uh, you only need a few chicks to feed the, the whole family for a year. Uh, a few chicks will give you the same amount of food. Um, and the risks, okay, are less genetic variation. So if there's a disease comes along, all of your chickens die. My year nine students know that I'd like to talk about bananas at this point because we had wiped out uh, a Panama fungus disease, wiped out all the bananas that were used, all the banana trees, tr bushes, herbs. They're not a tree, really. Okay, all the banana plants, they all got wiped out just after the Second World War. And then we had to breed a new one and we still don't have bananas that taste as good as the old ones. Now it's the Cavendish that got wiped out, and now we have the Big Mac. Yeah, things up. There's that way. Around. Okay, and uh, all right. What's your question? Oh, uh, yeah, risks. So you've got more chance of a uh, disease wiping out all of your chickens. Keep on chickens here. It's a chicken question. Don't talk about bananas, but it's the same stuff. Um, they lose. Possibly good traits that you might want in the future. So maybe the chicks that you ignored would be good at surviving the dis new disease that comes along. Um, and so you've lost that. And so that's why we go back to the jungle and find those jungle fowl again and breed them up again. Um, there also can be health issues due to them having large bones. I know turkeys, they're 
um, their bones are not thick enough to take their own weight and so therefore yeah, while they're actually being farmed um, most of them snap their own bones and uh, it's, it's not nice don't visit a factory farm for turkeys all turkeys are in factory farms there's no such thing as a free range turkey free range chickens much nicer you don't have them um snapping their bones and then and then being dragged off the floor and made into nuggets yeah free range and um uh, also, oh, or and organic get the get the let the chickens get some fun in the sun okay here we go uh, sh uh figure nine shows the number of organ transplants needed and the number of donors available in the USA from 1991 to 2018. Yes, you, white people, you don't get the data for 2020 and 2022 because it takes them years to get the data and um, to crunch the data and put it into computers and then get in the exams. Here we go. Number of people, oh, 100,000. Number of organ transplants needed. Uh, in the USA. Okay, so 100,000 um, organs, don't know, hearts, livers, kidneys. 100,000 organs, it won't be skin. Skin's an organ, but you don't chunk, well, you do bits of it, but you can take it from one person, put it to the same person. Now, it's going to be hearts, lungs, livers. Uh, number of donors available, oh, not so many. 100,000 needed in... 2008 and only, oh, 50, 25, that's 20, 15,000 were available. 100,000 were needed. Okay, here we go. Compare the number of donors available with the number of organ transports needed between 1991 and 2018. Use the information from the graph. Cool. So, first thing you notice, and you write down, First mark that the number of transplants needed is increasing as we go from 1990 to 2020. That's because people are living to older ages. And as you get older, your organs wear out. So because people are living longer, there's more transplant organs needed. Also because the hospitals are getting better at um, detecting that you need a new organ and in the USA there might be a little bit of hey you can make money out of transplanting organs so yeah don't like um, health systems that make money out of ill people they want to keep them ill and they want to do unnecessary surgery and all that kind of stuff so some of these organ transplants will actually be unnecessary oh I've got a new heart but your old heart was fine anyway it would last you another 30 years and where Keep going. Uh, okay. Uh, the, oh, yeah. Uh, the number of donors available very is a small increase, whereas a large increase for a number of organ transplants needed, and then it decreases after two thousand. Well, that's two thousand ten. That's two thousand and twenty. Each one of these is a year. After two thousand and four, it begins to decrease. Now. That might be because America's um, uh, expected age, their life expectancy, is now going down uh, because of drug taking and guns and car crashes and the like. So now people actually aren't living as long in America. Okay, here we go. Anything else that we had to do? Uh, no, no, no. All right, next one. Part two. Statewide scientists are genetically engineering animals for organ transplants. Yes, because, well, there's lots of money to be made. These, these old rich people with um, hearts that don't work anymore, they'll pay you loads of money if you do a transplant. But you can't always get a motorcyclist with no crash helmet to crash and then donate his body. Uh, uh, or their uh, parents or guardians. So... What are you going to do about it? Well, so we're trying to get pigs to be able to donate their organs because, you know, you're allowed to breed up pigs and uh, use them for organ transplants. Oh, there's a movie about this called The Island. I watched last night. Cool, good movie. Okay. 
Um, yes, why are they doing this? Because there are not enough donors available to increase the number of organs for donation to meet the demand for organ transplants. There we go, next one. Now, anyway, and we've got a Robin, Robin Redbreast, for those people that don't reside in England, like my CSI students. Hi, guys. And uh, they're just coming up to their exams next week. Uh, this is my draft exam. Uh, hopefully this will help with the exam they're going to be doing. The photograph shows a Robin. Yes, there it is. Uh, it's got a red breast. Robin red breast. The Robins are songbirds. Yes, they, they sing a lot. Chirpy, chirpy. Um, not particularly brilliant songs, but anyway, it's nice. Robins usually attract one mate for a breeding season. Yes, one male, one female for one season. And they only tend to live two or three years at a maximum. Anyway, here we go. In the spring, male robins sing loudly to attract a female. Yes. Complete the sentence by putting a cross. Okay. Just in case you weren't sure what a cross is, they, they've drawn one for you. In the, these are real exams uh, on Exam Wizard. Um, in the box next to your answer, this type of behavior is uh, courtship. Yes. Courtship. The, uh, the male robin is courting a female. Habituation is something you do, um, it's a habit, like smoking. Uh, imprinting? Oh, this is copying what your parents do. Uh, no, because the young chicks just do this naturally. It, it's, it's an instinct, it's born inside them. They don't, uh, imprinting is when uh, you have some ducks and their duck eggs and you look after the duck eggs and the ducks um, they get out of the egg and then they follow you around even though you're a human and that's called imprinting conditioning oh, okay that's um, Pavlov's dogs Pavlov Mr. Pavlov did some really nasty experiments but he also did the one he's famous for ringing a bell when he gave them food these dogs and so then he found out that he could just ring the bell and they'd, they'd produce saliva anyway even when there's no food involved he, he did some quite nasty experiments but we learned some science from him yeah okay suggest a different way a robin can communicate oh well they've got red breasts and they flap their wings um yes red breasts flap their wings the females know you're a robin because you've got red breast. Uh, the rabbiter, the bretter. The survival rate of the offspring of many animals is very low. Yes, unfortunately. A, a robin produced 12 offspring, but only five survived their first year. Well, that's pretty good. That is nearly half of them survived. Calculate the percentage survival rate for the offspring of this robin. So it's five out of 12. We do five divided by 12 times 100. And yeah. You get 42%. Cool. Or 41.7. And you round it up to 42%. Cool. Two marks. Suggest how robins care for their offspring. Oh, well, um, they care for their offspring by getting them food. Um, every two or three minutes, the uh, mother or the father get back to the nest with caterpillars mostly. But they will take worms. And spiders are particularly good for their proteins. Uh, they protect their offspring by putting them high in a tree in a nest so the offspring's protected from predators such as hedgehogs hedgehogs are nice they usually eat worms and stuff which people don't care about worms but they will eat any any anything um yeah i think, they, I think they're um, they're also into fruit is hedgehogs but yes up in the trees they're safe from hedgehogs hedgehogs small little mammal loads of spiky bits um yeah have a look oh it's on youtube hedgehog uh they protect them and they keep them warm by keeping them in the nest which is full of feathers and other bits of stuff to keep them warm robins eat worms yes they do 10 worms uh, the worms provide them with the carbohydrates the spiders more with the proteins 10 worms were placed in the center of a choice chamber okay there's a choice chamber the worms have the choice either that side or this side here we go uh, half the chamber was in the light and half the chamber was in the dark. Uh, dark? Light? I'd guess. The diagram shows the position of the worms after one hour. So the, the worms have detected light and dark. They've moved over to the dark side. Star Wars reference. There we go. Uh, that's a worm. Okay, that's the key. Very important in case you weren't sure what a worm was. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of... Uh, Myths about worms, you chop them in half, you get two worms. No, you don't, you get two halves that are dying. 
explain how this behavior helps worms to survive. Well, worms, they live underground in holes. You can see worm cast, which is sort of worm poo. Uh, it's they eat the ground. The worm poo's not nasty, it's, it's okay. Um, but it does look like poo. Um, and they live in the ground, in their holes, squirmy, squirmy, and they get leaves. And they drag the leaf under the ground, munchy, munchy. So worms know that they're going to be safe in the dark. That's the place you want to be, in the light. Only if you're hungry, uh, grab a leaf. Here we go. Explain how this behavior helps the worms to survive. Okay, so first of all, uh, in the dark, they're harder to see. So they'll be more likely to come up for leaves in a dark part of your garden rather than right in the middle of the grass when it's the middle of the day sunshine. Uh, these are dumb worms. These ones are definitely going to be uh, Darwin. Um, nature's going to provide them with uh, not having babies. Yeah, natural selection on the way. Okay. Um, yep, so uh, also worms get eaten by hedgehogs, I mentioned that. So this behavior keeps them safe from hedgehogs underneath the ground because hedgehogs can't dig very well. And, uh, yep, yeah, and camouflage. Uh, okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, and also underneath the ground, they don't overheat. Whereas in the sun, they can dry out. You often see um, dried up worms on roads because they can't dig into the road. Question six. Answer the question with a cross in a box you think is correct. And there's just in case you didn't know what a cross was. It, if they do this in real exams. This is real exams, GCSEs and, and on exam, um, which is uh, Pearson. If you, IGCSE, if, and GCSE, if you change your mind about an answer, put a line through the box. Oh, okay. That's quite nice of them to tell you that. And then mark your new answer with a cross. Okay, cool. Some drugs used to treat cancer are taken into cells by active transport. Yeah, active transport. I haven't told my year, year nine this. Uh, there's diffusion, there's osmosis, there's active transport. Um, that's, that means parts of your body grab things that are going past. Anyway, here we go. Um, and the root of plants do this when they grab minerals out of the soil. And your uh, kidneys do this to keep the salt in your, um, uh, in you, in your blood. Uh, and you don't want to pee out all the good minerals. Anyway, here we go. Figure three shows some causes of preventable cases of cancer in 2015. Okay. Uh, okay. There's not many smokers anymore, but even in 2015, preventable cancers. Wow, tobacco's got like about a third of it. i well, looking at the graph. Other cases, so other causes, there's going to be thousands of them. They're all going to take up such a small chunk of the bar chart. They, they haven't written them in. Uh, UV radiation, that's skin cancer. A much bigger slice of the pie chart in Australia for UV radiation. Yeah, that's very, very good. A hole in the ozone layer made it very popular in New Zealand and Australia to get skin cancer. Alcohol, now that's a surprise. Whoa. Alcohol causes cancer. Uh, overweight and obesity. Well, I knew they were bad, 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 but also causing cancer. Wow. Okay, here we go. What is the percentage of preventable cases of cancer that are caused by tobacco? Mm. Oh, there's no percentage there. So the whole thing adds up to 100. So we do 100% take away 37. So that's going to leave us 63. 63, take away 8. 63, take away 8. 55, take away 7. 55, take away 7. 48. 48, take away 14. 48, 38. 34. 34, 34, 34%. Yes, it's there. Got it right. Uh, of course. Here we go. Uh, in 2015, data from the Cancer Research UK suggested that 163,440 cases of cancer could have been prevented. Yes, some cancers prevented, some cancers you can't prevent. Uh, Leukaemia is a particularly difficult one. Uh, calculate the number of preventable cases. Oh God, I mean, skin cancer, most of them are preventable. 
put on some, you know, stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, sunscreen. Uh, wear a hat. All that kind of good stuff. Um, don't don't let your skin burn. Red, burny, burny. No, no, not good. Not bad. Calculate the number of preventable cases of cancer caused by alcohol. Oh, go up to the chart. Alcohol is 7%, so we need 7 divided by 100. That's why the two zeros are there, and that's why that say forward slash, because that means divide, and the two zeros means 100. 7 divided by 100 times by that number there. Hold on a second. Uh, okay. Uh, it's 11,440. Ha! Uh, and then I'll allow you to round it and then put it down in comments. <laughs> oh, oh, no, you can't do comments because this is for... Yeah. Okay, it's 11,441 when it's rounded. Uh, you write that there. And in this big space, you write down 7 divided by 100 times by uh, 163,440. Cool. Here we go. Question seven. Uh, figure 10 shows the number, it's a table of results, number of people diagnosed with sexually transmitted diseases, STIs uh, or STDs, sexually transmitted infections. Oh, yes, okay. So it also called STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. In the UK during 2017, like I said, it takes a few years for the exams to come through. Sexually transmitted infections, chlamydia. Oh yeah, there's loads of chlamydia. It's become very fashionable. Gonorrhea, there's much less gonorrhea around since we've had uh, antibiotics and stuff. Genital herpes, that's a virus. Uh, that's a bacteria. That's a bacteria. Genital warts, another uh, virus. Uh, genitals, there's a, that's uh, that's your junk. Uh, that's 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 the front of your your. Okay. Carrying on, so that's that's what genitals mean: uh, penis and 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 labias and, and vaginas and all that stuff. Um, usually on the outside. Uh, syphilis. Ooh, don't know what causes that. Might be also a bacteria. Here we go. And the numbers: number of people diagnosed per one thousand population. Well, the one that's missing is is hepatitis. Hepatitis B, C, and A. There, there's many more people with hepatitis, and that's also sexually transmitted. They they've missed out. A whole bunch of people. And, and of course, there's AIDS and HIV. And Okay, they didn't do all of them. They've just done the ones they wanted. 3.7, 0.8, 0.6, 1.1. .1. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. It's not in the right order. 0.1. Here we go. State the sexually transmitted infection that has the median. Oh, that's why it's not in the right order. Number of people diagnosed. If you put it in the right order, it's top, second, middle, bottom, nearly bottom. So the middle one is the median. Ah, oh, no, no, my you know, I haven't done that one. But anyway, there we are. The population of the UK in uh, 2017 was 66 billion. Yep, yep, slowly going up. Calculate the number, the total number of people diagnosed with chlamydia in the UK in 2017. Okay, 2017, we're going to have to do 3.7... Um, per 1,000. So we do 66 million divided by 1,000, which gives you 66,000. 66,000 times 3.7. 66,000 times 3.7. Uh, okay. Hold on. Uh, uh, 244,200. Cool. Uh, approximately. Calculate the number of people. Yeah, done it. State wide chlamydia can be described as a communicable disease. Oh, okay, because it, it's passed on from person to person. Um, something like cancer doesn't come from one person to the next person, but chlamydia and all of the sexually transmitted diseases, you, you get it goes from one person to the next person. They're also COVID and flu and cold go from person to person. Um, and the sexually transmitted diseases are by skin contact or by blood contact. You can actually get it from taking drugs, uh, injecting drugs. You can get um, AIDS and all those nasties. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, 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 give one way 
the transmission of chlamydia can be prevented using a condom or the female version of a condom called a femidon. Um, avoid sex. Um, uh, you can screen people for infection. Just get everybody, find out if they're infected, and if they are, then you cure them by using antibiotics and stuff. Um, uh, okay. Explain why chlamydia can be treated by antibiotics. Oh, biotics, biots, bacteria. So it's because uh, chlamydia is caused by a bacteria, whereas the herpes and the warts um, don't kill people, but they're not nice, um, and they're, they're made by viruses. So you can't use antibiotics on those. It has to be a bacteria to use antibiotics and have any chance of working. Here we go. If a person drinks too much alcohol, liver cells die. Yes, um, that's called uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And the person can develop cirrhosis of the liver. Oh, there you go. The <laughs> relative risk of developing cirrhosis of the liver is affected by two factors. The volume of alcohol a person drinks. Yeah, more alcohol, more chance of busting up your liver. Uh, your liver's there to, to absorb any poisons that are in your food. Uh, when it first gets into your bloodstream, the blood goes from your small intestine to the liver and then out of the liver elsewhere after the liver's cleaned it up. Uh, so uh, only about 10% of your alcohol that you drink as it gets into your bloodstream and then your liver takes up about 90% of that. So only a small amount gets to your brain, but enough to get you drunk. Uh, number two. Whether the person drinks the alcohol on its own or with a meal. Oh, okay, drinking with food, drinks alcohol with, drinks alcohol with food, much less chance of giving you cirrhosis of the liver. Ah, this is why people in France and stuff, they, they drink wine uh, and, uh, and, and they, they don't get the whole alcohol die off problem. Figure 5 shows how these two factors affect the relative risk of people developing cirrhosis of the liver. Here we go. Relative risk of... Relative means... Uh, you know, uh, you, you're comparing them. Okay. Because uh, not exactly the same number of people drink alcohol with meals as drink alcohol on its own. So you use statistics to change the numbers so that you can directly compare them. Here we go. Um, okay, number of units of alcohol consumed. Ah, done that with my students, bless you. Number of units consumed. So that's half a beer is one unit, or a small glass of wine is one unit, or one um, shot of uh, whiskey is one unit. Um, I think alka pops are one and a half units. Here we go. Number of units consumed. So the more alcohol consumed, the more chance you have of getting your liver not working and uh, very difficult to get, very painful to get somebody to donate, donate half their liver to you. you know, people don't like doing it. There we go. So, uh, yeah, number of units of alcohol consumed. Yeah, if you keep it below seven, much less chance of anything bad happening. Around about 14, so two wines a night, two small glasses, you're okay, you haven't increased. But you, you get to the three glasses of wine, and hold on, three times, 721, three, you've doubled your risk of cirrhosis of the liver if you have three wines compared to no wines, if you're drinking the alcohol on its own. But if you drink with food, hardly any increase at all. In order to double your, you have to have the 32, okay. Uh, you have to have four, four and a half in order to double your risk. So anyway, uh, drink alcohol with food. Have food first. Uh, person A drinks alcohol on his own. Person B drinks alcohol with their meals. Calculate the different risk for these two people when each drinks 28 units of alcohol. So and 28 units, the guy that drinks alcohol on its own has got a risk of three. The person who drinks alcohol with meals have got a risk of 1.8. Three, take away 1.8, 1.2. Calculate the difference in risk, 1.2. Using evidence from figure five, state two pieces of health advice for people about drinking alcohol. Uh, drink less, uh, drink it with food. Uh, yeah, reduce alcohol intake, um, have it with meals. Don't drink it on its own, here we go. 
oh, okay, um, sorry, that, that's, that's where my draft went a little bit wrong. Anyway, I've already done those guys. Here we go. Uh, and then with the minerals, making rocks into iron to make your dad's car. Uh, and also tables and chairs in the, the schoolroom. And there's iron and steel inside concrete buildings. There's a, a lumps of metal pointing out of the top when they're making a building. Iron can be extracted from a naturally occurring substance called hematite. Yeah, H-A-E-M. That always means something to do with iron. It's, a, it's from the Greek word. Okay, and there's ferric and ferrous from the Roman word, the Latin word. State the name given to the naturally occurring substances from which metals are extracted. Oh, the ores or minerals. So, yeah. Yeah, the rocks are called ores, uh, and they're also called minerals. Mm. Okay. Uh, if you're not sure which one to write, write both. In the extra ore is... Probably better. In the extraction of iron, iron oxide is heated with carbon to form iron. A gas is formed. And we've got oxygen and carbon. Oh, guess what gas we get when we put oxygen and carbon together? Write the word equation for this reaction. Well, iron plus carbon, arrow, iron, oh, no, hold on. Iron oxide plus iron, start again. Iron oxide, which is the rock, plus carbon arrow carbon dioxide plus iron is the iron you wanted to make the car yes carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide it's a little bit more complicated than that but that'll do for those two marks here we go metals are extracted from substances naturally occurring in the earth's crust yeah rocks ores uh, zinc can be extracted by heating zinc oxide with carbon oh here we go same stuff uh, the products are zinc and carbon dioxide. Zinc, carbon dioxide over here on the right. And on the, the left, we have zinc oxide plus carbon. And an arrow in between. Them. So, zinc oxide, which is the rock, plus carbon, arrow, zinc, plus carbon dioxide. There we go. In the reaction, zinc oxide loses oxygen. Yes. State the type of reaction that takes place when oxide loses oxygen. That's called a reduction reaction. Excellent! Good luck with your exams, guys. Uh, it won't be the same questions, but uh, the other teacher will hopefully do something similar. Bye!